tonight, a special meeting held to discuss the Lavernia ISD superintendent as he faces allegations of inappropriate behavior. Plans to drain four Guadalupe Blanco River Authority lakes put on hold, at least for now. Plus, we'll tell you about a new state law that encourages universities to make the transfer process easier and cheaper. Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming from right here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Myra Arthur. The future of the Lavernia ISD superintendent Trent Levette still on the line tonight. Right now, the school board of trustees is meeting for a second time to discuss this. This is after a recent allegation that Levette inappropriately touched a high school cheerleader during a football game. Our Jeffany Gray is covering this meeting for us tonight. Jeffany joins us there live and Jeffany, it seems almost like deja vu. This board is still in a closed session tonight. Yes, that's right, Myra. As we speak, a closed session is going on right now, but before then was a public comment session where several people in the community were able to stand up at the podium and speak with a max time of about five minutes. Well, like last week, this week, several people, if not all the people who spoke at the podium, spoke in favor of Dr. Levette keeping his job. Now, the recent allegation against Levette by a high school student is not the first accusation he's faced of inappropriate behavior. Last year, people he was accused, or last year he was accused by the school staff of inappropriate workplace behavior. He was placed on leave but reinstated with a written reprimand soon after. But about two weeks ago, he was reported by a cheerleader at an away game who claimed Levette rubbed her back in an uncomfortable manner. Tonight, his future with the district is unclear. Many in attendance who spoke with us say at the end of the day, they just want the truth. Honestly, never came to school board meetings until this. Um, but I just can't sit back and let somebody uh, somebody's hold life possibly be ruined over this. If something comes back at the police say so elsewise, you know, we're fine with that. But for right now, we do feel the need to stick up for him because it's not fair and it's not right. And I don't know who's going to come back to this community to take his place. Now, we're still waiting for them to come out of the closed session, but after that will be an open session. But even with that in mind, it is still unclear if a decision will be made yet again. We hope to have an update for you guys tonight at 10. But for right now, I'll send it back to you, Myra. All right, a lot more to follow. Thanks, Jeffany. College can be a big expense, and for transfer students, that expense can be even bigger if they take credits at one school that won't transfer to another. But a new Texas law is trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. Sarah Acosta spoke with the UTSA administration and students there about what the university is doing to make the transfer process more efficient and cheaper. So I already had Northwest Vista in there, but you could add another university. University of Texas San Antonio senior Sherilyn Davenport transferred to UTSA from Northwest Vista College last fall. She said she had a seamless transfer experience, but knows that is not the case for many students. It's a really harsh thing that happens and it just it sucks hearing about it. She says she didn't lose any credits because of the transfer calculator that the university launched last year. It tells you everything about the transfer calculator and then it has a link to try the transfer calculator. It's one of the tools that UTSA says they put in place to make the transfer process easier for students. It's also why UTSA administration believes they are a step ahead of a new law that went into effect this summer. The Texas legislature passed a law with the goal of making it easier for college students to avoid taking classes that won't transfer. But I really do like the fact that they're trying to save us money, time, energy, and really make the transition from two-year to four-year college much smoother. The law asks universities and community colleges to make information about courses more transparent and accessible. The law specifically asks universities to report any credits that students lost during their transfer process to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Texas Legislature every year no later than March 1st. Lynn Barnes is with the Strategic Enrollment Department with UTSA. He says this law will be an evolving one. He believes once more data is collected, the state will be able to determine more definite ways to prevent students from losing college credit hours. What we're trying to do is get in front of that and advise the students early on so that they can make the most use of their time and money. For The Nine, I'm Sarah Acosta.
In addition to the transfer calculator, UTSA has a partnership with Alamo District Colleges where UTSA advisors are on each of the Alamo College campuses. UTSA says it will continue to strengthen those partnerships to abide by this new law that's now in place. And this isn't the only new law that went into effect after the last state legislature wrapped up. There are hundreds of others. We did a breakdown of some of the big ones as part of our Understand series here on the 9. To check some of those out, go to ksat.com slash news at 9. The city of San Antonio is gearing up to pass a $2.9 billion balanced budget tomorrow morning. In the record-setting budget, taxpayers can expect to see plans for more uniformed officers, improved streets, and affordable housing. In a last-minute move, money was also set aside to build a new police substation in District 3. About $500,000 will be included in the budget to go toward the roughly $20 million needed. A bond project will still be needed to pay for the substation, but advocates for the districts say the money is a show of good faith that it is coming soon. We'll have more information on what departments will get more money than last year tonight on the Night Beat. Meantime, the county approving its 2019-2020 budget yesterday. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from that. The total $1.782 billion there. $160 million will go toward debt service. $32 million toward nine road projects. Flood control a big priority as well with $16.45 million set aside to address that issue. And then for next year's election, $200,000 will be spent on community outreach and educational materials about new voting machines that will be in place. Coming up in just a few minutes, we'll also tell you about money to fund a needle exchange program with the hopes of preventing the spread of disease and deadly overdoses. Now let's turn to the 9 at 9 tonight. This is a rundown of some of the most interesting stories making headlines from right here at home to all around the world. Police say a man attacks his cousin with a machete. A group of inmates struck by lightning and a truck caught on camera landing on top of a house. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. San Antonio police say a man was stabbed by his cousin with a machete this morning. This happened at an apartment southwest of downtown. According to police, the men were arguing when one of them grabbed a machete and started hacking away. Luckily, the blade on the knife was a bit dull. The cousin stabbed was taken to a hospital. The other was taken into custody. A Chinese businesswoman has been found guilty of trespassing at President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Club in Fort Lauderdale. Yujing Zhang was also convicted of lying to Secret Service agents. The intrusion was initially investigated as a possible Chinese espionage effort, but no allegations of spying emerged during Zhang's trial. This California corn maze is a living tribute to a fallen police officer. Corporal Ranil Singh was shot and killed last year after pulling over a suspected drunk driver. His widow and son will be the first to walk through the maze during a special ceremony. A Lockhart High School teacher arrested after admitting to having an improper relationship with a female student. Taylor Seymour had worked for the district since 2016. She was arrested yesterday and booked into the Caldwell County Jail. A Fort Worth woman is appealing her five-year sentence for illegal voting. She says she did not realize that her status as a felon made her ineligible to cast a ballot. She was on supervised release after serving time in prison for tax fraud when she filled out a provisional ballot. There's no way I would do anything to jeopardize leaving my kids again. There's no way that I would have went to vote if I knew I couldn't vote. No word on a date for that decision. Ten Louisiana inmates hurt after lightning struck a yard at a correctional center while they were playing flag football. One inmate said their shoes were scattered, overturned benches, ice coolers, and other debris on the prison grounds. All as a result of what happened, one inmate remains hospitalized in critical condition. London police are searching for a bicyclist caught on camera headbutting a pedestrian. Surveillance video shows that pedestrian crossing the street as the bicycle zooms by. The cyclist had a red light, then he gets off the bike and approaches the other man. They appear to exchange some words before the cyclist headbutts the man, knocking him down. That man did need stitches. 25,000 marijuana plants seized in Washington state. Police were tipped off by concerned community members. They used drones to help find the drugs. A man in Ontario, Canada, charged with reckless driving after his truck ended up on top of a house. 
Dash cam video shows the moment that truck hits a ditch and goes flying. Luckily, no one was inside that house at the time. To read more about these nine stories, go to ksat.com slash news at nine. Uh, that last video, uh, yeah. No. Jaw dropping. <laughs> Indeed. Hey, but let's talk <laughs> about a really good site around here today. Yeah. We saw some rain. A little jaw dropping, kind of two rounds of rain. One early this morning and then another this afternoon. So I hope your yard got at least a little bit of rain. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, uh, can we have <laughs> some more, please? Yeah, that's more how it goes please. around here, right? Yeah. Some the, the haves and the have nots in yeah. terms yeah. of rain. Even at the airport, though, we got almost a half inch of rain. That's that's pretty good. That's what we were thinking we would see through the duration of the week. We saw those downpours really start to roll in on Monday. Rain chances have been around each day and we'll hold on to a isolated chance of rain tomorrow before we dry off heading into the weekend. But uh, almost a half inch of rain, not too bad. 73 the low this morning, up to 94 this afternoon before the rain. We've been in the low 80s for several hours now. And even though it's muggy out there, Adam and I were talking about this. It feels nice because it's just cooler than we typically are at this hour. A lot of the rain from earlier today has really wrapped up, but west of 35, we've still got some showers going. I've seen just a few lightning strikes, so a few rumbles of thunder here, but this for the most part is just some moderate rainfall, a little bit heavy at times where you see those brighter colors, the oranges and the reds, generally along and just west of Highway 83, moving into southern Real County. The deal with this rain the past couple of days, it has fallen really in some ideal spots. It's fallen over some of our communities, especially off to the southwest of San Antonio that are in an extreme drought. That's that bright red color there. There's been some rain there, especially today and really even over the past couple of hours. So really good to see that. But we've also gotten some good rain over parts of the aquifer uh, contributing and recharge zones here that are outlined in red. That's where we need rain to fall to see an uptick in the aquifer level. And over the past 48 hours, we have had some nice little pockets uh, of some heavier rain that have fallen there and the aquifer uh, will be responding. So that is pretty good. A couple of couple of good things there when it comes to the rainfall over the past couple of days. The other side of the rain, of course, is mold. Today the count was moderate with a count of 650. I would bet it is going to go up as we get into the day tomorrow should stay pretty elevated. We'll have a couple more showers around on Thursday that could keep the count elevated into Friday and then that mold count should start to go down as we get a little bit closer to the weekend. But just something to keep in mind as you're planning your day tomorrow that mold count could be pretty elevated overnight tonight for most of us mostly cloudy skies, low temperatures, low to mid 70s. Those showers will linger for a few more hours west of 35 and then as we get into your Thursday, a 20% chance for isolated showers. A few non severe storms will be possible, especially as we get into the afternoon and then late tomorrow evening rain chances will start to wrap up. Weekend is rapidly approaching. We'll talk more about that forecast coming up. Myra. Most potential 2020 primary voters don't know the candidates for Texas U.S. Senate seat. That's according to a new UT Texas Tribune poll. When asked who they would vote for if the Democratic U.S. Senate primary were to be held today, 53% said that they haven't thought about it enough to have an opinion. 13% said they didn't know. MJ Hagar was the candidate who received the largest number of votes with 11% choosing her. These candidates are all in the running for the seat currently held by Republican John Cornyn. He is running for reelection. Meanwhile, this same UT Texas Tribune poll also asked Democratic voters about the most important issues facing the state. The top three issues they cited were gun control and violence, political corruption and leadership and health care. Earlier today, I had the honor of emceeing the Legacy of Hope Luncheon for the Ecumenical Center here in San Antonio. They do such incredibly important work, providing hope, counseling, mental health services throughout not only South Texas, but all across the state. Country music legend Naomi Judd was the keynote speaker at that luncheon, and she and I actually have something in common. We're originally from the same small town in Kentucky, and her mother and my grandmother knew each other. We had a little fun making that connection today. Take a look. Now, is anybody here when the fellow that introduced me said something about Ashley, Kentucky? It's Rinky Dinky, Kentucky. There's nobody here from Rinky Dinky, Kentucky. Your grandmother, that doesn't count. Oh, you were born there? You're a freak. Wow. Myra Arthur. 
her grandmother and my mom, who just died last week, were doing volunteer work at the little hospital, the King Cyrus Hospital in Rinky Dink, Kentucky. That is right, Naomi Judd, country music legend, called me a freak today. And that is the highlight of my week. It is going in my diary later. In all seriousness though, after all those laughs, Judd shared her personal story of addiction, abusive relationships, and the health challenges that she has faced, telling that crowd today that your past does not define you. So I have depression and panic disorder, and I want people to know that that's not who I am. When you say someone has heart disease, you know what that looks like. Or if you break a bone, you can, you can see it, the cast. Uh, if you have depression, that's a disease of the brain. It has to do with the chemicals in the brain. It has nothing to do with character. The Ecumenical Center provides mental health services and support, education, counseling. They were there and still are in the aftermath of the shooting in Sutherland Springs. And the center has also been called on to respond after the shootings in El Paso and Odessa most recently. There's a lot more ahead here on KSAP News at 9 tonight. But first, before we head to break, Today marks 18 years since the 9-11 terror attacks. People across the country, across the world, mark today with prayers and memorials. It's a day the U.S. will not soon forget. We ask some people who work right here in our very own newsroom what they remember about that day, September 11th, 2001. I was in eighth grade classroom in second passing period and I went to a Catholic school in Corpus Christi, Texas. I was walking to school, San Antonio College actually, and um, I was walking to school, this guy is coming away from the school and he stops me and he's like, hey man, there are no classes today, everything's been canceled, something's going on in New York. I was the um, editor-in-chief of my college newspaper. That day we were supposed to print. I was at home, sleep, got a phone call from my producer then, Cheryl Zachary, said, Greg, we're under attack. The first word I got was on the radio as, as I was driving in, and the, uh, the announcer at that point just broke into some music and said, we've just been notified that a plane has crashed into the, uh, the World Trade Center. I was getting ready for work. And of course the television was on. And we knew that something had happened because Sister Michelle Marie, um, who was a religion teacher, said we need to start praying. Sure enough, on all the channels was the first tower with smoke coming out of it. So I rushed to school. Um, we started you know, gathering the local angles of what was happening um, in the United States that day. Turn on the television said just in time to hear Charles Gibson, who is the then Good Morning America anchor say, is that a replay or is that another plane? We prayed as a, as a school, and then right after that, we as a class watched the second tower go down. My first thought was a small plane, my goodness, you know, what was he doing flying so low in New York City? I had no idea that it was a, was a jet liner. Uh, so I, I thought it was terrible, but had no idea the magnitude of this thing. And you realize this is really happening, that there this was intentional. Being from New York City, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was a sophomore in high school and I was sitting in math class. And I remember someone came to my classroom and knocked on the door and asked my teacher to come out. And when she came back in, she just had this blank, confused stare on her face. And then about six seconds later, she said, a plane just crashed into one of the Twin Towers. We couldn't really use the phones either because the phone lines were down. So we all were worried uh, for our families who work in Manhattan, either at the World Trade Center or around it or used, you know, past it to get to their jobs. I called the station, come in as soon as you can. So of course I did. And then photographer Sal Salazar and I took to the streets just trying to get reaction from people about what had happened. We don't really wrap our brain totally around this whole thing because we've got work to do. So it wasn't until later in the day that the gravity of the situation really, really hit home and I realized that, that our lives were never, ever going to be the same. You might hear noise in the background during KSAT News at 9. You want to know why? Our set is right in the middle of the always busy KSAT 12 newsroom. We are just feet away from reporters, producers, photographers, editors who were all working to put together the stories you see here on the news at 9 and throughout the day on KSAT 12. 
This is the assignment desk, really the control center of the KSAT 12 newsroom. Our assignment desk editor keeps track of all of these police and fire scanners to make sure our crews are headed out the door to see what's happening and make sure you know what's going on all around town. There's the KSAT 12 defenders tracking down the latest investigations and our weather team putting together an up to date forecast to make sure you are ready for your day. The streaming from right here in the KSAT 12 newsroom is just one of the reasons this show looks and feels so unique and we're glad you're watching. Bear County officials cite rising HIV and hepatitis C rates as the reason a needle exchange program is needed here. This week, $80,000 from the county budget was secured to fund this pilot program. The program will not only provide addicts with clean needles, but also the overdose antidote Narcan and information about treatment. The money will also pay for trained experts to hit the streets and interact face to face with addicts. HIV and hepatitis C are both associated with dirty needles. They're both on the rise, and we need to address that. Intravenous drug use is a problem in our community. These funds from the county will be available to use starting October 1st. Let's turn now to some of the biggest stories people are talking about tonight. The Supreme Court is allowing nationwide enforcement of a new Trump administration rule that prevents most Central American migrants from seeking asylum in the U.S. The high court's order undoes a lower court ruling that had blocked the new asylum policy in some states along the southern border. This policy denies asylum to anyone who passes through another country on their way to the U.S. without first seeking protection there. President Trump says his administration will propose banning thousands of flavors used in e-cigarettes. This comes amid an outbreak of breathing problems tied to vaping. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar says the FDA will develop guidelines to remove all e-cigarette flavors from the market, especially those favored by children. An estimated 2,500 people are listed as missing in the Bahamas in Hurricane Dorian's aftermath. Those names haven't yet been checked against those who had evacuated. The country's National Emergency Management Agency says they expect the list to shrink as those names are checked. The number of confirmed deaths from that storm remains at 50, but that number is expected to rise. Katie Blake is back with us tonight, and we know some people out there didn't get a chance to see rain no. today. No. We would love some more mm -hmm. to head this way. Yes. <laughs> and this time of year, some of our rain could come from the tropics. Yes. I knew it was time to address the rumors of something going on in the Gulf when my mom called me and was like, is there going to be something in the Gulf? She's over in Houston. So I was like, Why do okay. moms always talk like that in invitations? <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah. As oh, a mom, I don't know that I like that now, but I've done it. <laughs> so, so. Sorry. Anyway, she was like, it's okay, fine. Okay. So. Let's talk about it. Uh, it is uh, the peak of hurricane season. Actually, the historical peak of it, uh, Atlantic hurricane season was yesterday on the 10th, and we do have a few things going. I want to give you kind of a, a big overview. We've got a disturbance coming off uh, the coast of Africa. That has a 40% chance of development in the next five days. We'll keep an eye on that. It's expected to continue to drift west. We've got a disturbance that's not going to do anything here uh, that is still off to the east of the Caribbean, but a little bit closer to home near the Bahamas. There is a disturbance at the National Hurricane Center is watching and gives a 70% chance of development over the next five days, a 50% chance of development over the next 48 hours. And by development, I mean potentially becoming our next tropical depression. It really looks somewhat impressive on satellite tonight. We'll keep an eye on it. It's still got a long ways to go. Uh, but here is the area that the National Hurricane Center thinks that this system could drift to within the next two to five days. So that would be over the Bahamas, Florida, and then potentially in the eastern and central Gulf of Mexico. So here's why we're not overly concerned about this. Here's that potential tropical system there. And then I've put the upper level winds of the atmosphere over top of what's going on with this tropical satellite. We've got a swirl here 
sitting right over Florida. That's a piece of upper level energy or an upper level low. And over the next few days, as we get into the weekend and early next week, this upper level low is going to slide off to the west a little bit closer to us here in Texas and could actually end up tossing us some showers as we get into the back half of the weekend and then early next week. But what we also anticipate this doing due to the counterclockwise rotation of this upper level low, that's going to keep this potential tropical system well to our east, and we're not expecting that to be an issue for us here in Texas, uh, really in the western Gulf of Mexico. So of course we'll keep you updated, but this is what we're looking at heading into the weekend and next week. A couple of days to dry off here. I can't roll out a stray shower Friday and then again on Sunday, but with that upper level low moving in early next week, it'll have a little bit of lift and that could bring us a chance for some isolated showers and storms as we get into Monday and Tuesday of next week. Temperatures though you'll notice still staying pretty toasty in the mid to upper 90s. Bearded go laws are now in effect across Texas, so we wanted to break down some numbers relating to this rapidly growing industry to see how the new laws could affect San Antonio craft breweries. Let's start with how the craft brewing boom has already impacted the state's economy. Texas craft breweries generated $5.3 billion in 2017. That's according to JLL Research and the Brewers Association. Meanwhile, the average wage for a craft brewery worker is about $53,000. There are 301 breweries in Texas. This includes brew pubs, microbreweries, planned breweries, regional breweries, and tap rooms. Here at home, we've also seen a rise. We have 29, with six more in the planning stages. But when compared to other big Texas cities, we fall well below Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Last year, Alamo Beer Company was the top craft brewer in our area, followed by Freetail and Southerly. We've uh, had a friendly competition among our local brewers for years. Uh, we're really more compatriots uh, together. Uh, than we are competitors. Uh, so it is kind of, it's nice to know that uh, we are the uh, number one as far as volume goes. Busted Sandal and Guadalupe Brewing round out the top five producers in San Antonio. Alamo produced close to 5,200 barrels last year, but compare that to the top producers across the state like St. Arnold in Houston and Deep Alum in Dallas, and you can see we still have a ways to go. Our biggest competition is really ignorance. And when I say that, it's, it's really through education, letting folks know in the San Antonio area that we have beer that's made here local. Some of the major takeaways, the number of breweries in Texas has surged over the last decade with more on the way. Craft beer production has grown by 35% in the last five years. The number of planned breweries of which San Antonio has six shows a healthy future for craft beer in Texas. The passing of the Beer to Go Bill is one of the many positive legislative changes the industry has seen in recent years, increasing awareness, competition, and revenue for Texas craft beer. The real market is continuing to look at where the rooftops are, look at what areas are underserved as far as a brewery that you can walk to or a short drive from your home, because people do want to support that local business. We profiled several breweries in our area in our Essay Spirit series. You can see those stories right now on ksat.com slash news at nine. For The Nine, RG Marcus. A temporary win today for people living and working on several area lakes. Four lakes controlled by the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority will not be drained on Monday as was scheduled, but this is only a brief pause while a court hearing plays out. Property owners from six GBRA lakes, including Lake Dunlap and Wood, which have already drained after spillgate failures there earlier this year, they filed two lawsuits trying to stop the draining of lakes McQueeny, Placid, Meadow and Gonzales. The GBRA has said the draining is necessary due to safety concerns over the aging dams on those lakes, but property owners ask a judge today during a court hearing in Guadalupe Lupe County to put a temporary stop to these plans until a trial can be held. Attorneys for the property owners spent a good portion of that hearing questioning the actual danger that these dams pose and the GBRA's reasoning for lowering the lakes. This decision, as we've established by the evidence, was made years ago. That GBRA made a conscious decision that it was going to get out of the hydroelectric dam business and it was essentially going to abandon the dams and not uh, maintain them as they should be maintained and certainly not replace the dams. I've seen no indication that GBRA is doing anything other than their job. Uh, they are working hard to try to find a solution to these issues. Uh, they are complex issues. 
This hearing is set to continue on Monday. That's the same day the draining was supposed to happen. But again, that's that's off for now. So the judge has issued a temporary restraining order on lowering those lakes until he decides whether to issue a longer hold. Let's go to KSAT.com right now to find out what is trending tonight with Ivan Herrera. That's right, Myra. Right. Three great trending stories for you today. The first one's a little bit scary. Okay. I, I always have to bring in something weird for you. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of cool also. Uh, so a newly identified eel was just discovered, and it's actually giving record-breaking electrical jolts. So as Ooh. you know, you know some eels can yeah, that's, electrify. Yeah, that's their thing. <laughs> Okay. So the Smithsonian National uh, Museum of Natural History has identified actually two species. Uh, one of them is the one that I just told you about that's a little bit more, um, a little crazy. A little so, charged. Yes, yeah, okay. so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to pronounce a name, so I'm not going to pronounce it, but uh, it can discharge up to 860 volts of electricity, wow. which is a lot. Eesh. And they can grow up to eight feet, so like two oh more feet eight more than feet. me. <laughs> And a fun fact for you, there are actually 250 species of fish that are able to generate electricity, but the eel is the only one that uses it for hunting and self-defense, which I thought was pretty oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. So cool. a little fun fact for you today. All right, next up, a little nostalgia for 90s kids. So <laughs> Green Day, Weezer, and Fall Out Boy, three of my favorites, are joining forces for a massive 2020 tour that's coming up next okay. summer. I bet that's going to be yes. really popular. Yes, and people are already going crazy for it. So the bands are expected to promote new music during the tour. I know we all like our old, you know, sounds. You know they're going to have yeah. old favorites because why yes. would they not? But they're definitely going to have some new stuff. So the Hella Mega Tour, which is what it's called, <laughs> will kick off in Europe in June. And then they'll be coming here to North America in July. But if you want to catch them in Texas, you have to wait till late July because they're going to be coming to Houston and Arlington around that time. Uh, okay. So yeah, definitely. No um, San Antonio dates. Yeah, and in honor of the big news, all three of the bands actually released a new single. So every single one has a new single already. Okay. So, so you got some time yeah, to get to familiar with up. the new stuff. Exactly. Okay. And so that'll be happening next summer. Catch more on KSAT.com. Cool. All right, this last one is a big one. As you may have heard yesterday, Apple just released its new iPhone. But this is not the story about the iPhone. This is actually about the new streaming service that they just released, which I thought was pretty cool. So it's trying to take on Netflix, which is huge, as yeah, you know. Yeah, juggernaut, um, right. So it's offering its new streaming service for $4.99, which is mind-blowing for a lot a of month. people. Wow. Yeah. So starting November 1st, and if you buy the new iPhone or any of their new um, electronics that they're putting out, you get a, a year of free, the Apple streaming service oh, for free. Okay. Yeah. So for some comparison for you, I wanted to give you some numbers. Disney's new streaming service will cost $7, and Netflix's most basic plan costs about $8.99. So it's really low on the low end. But okay. there's here's the kicker. It has less stuff than Netflix and, and mm. Disney are going to have. But that might increase as time progresses. Apple's kind of tight-lipped about it. They haven't said a lot yet, but I think as more time goes by, we're yeah. going to learn a little bit more. But I did want to include this for anybody who missed it. Apple did release a new iPhone, iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro. They also released a new iPad, an Apple Watch 5. There's a lot of stuff. And a new video game subscription service called Oof. Apple Arcade, which actually rolls out next Thursday. Okay, so and there's a lot of a Apple lot of to new talk stuff. about. There yes. are so many different streaming services it's about to, to hit up. the market. Yes. yes, but thanks for helping us with the yes. Apple. So more portion. on KSAT.com, and that's all I got for you today. Thank all you right. for having me. Thanks, Ivan. We'll be right back. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. General Motors is recalling almost 3.5 million pickups and SUVs under pressure from the government over a brake problem. That recall including Chevy, GMC and Cadillac models including the Silverado and the Cadillac Escalade. The recall is being triggered by a brake problem that could cause increased stopping distance and has been under investigation since November. Well, the payment company Square filing a lawsuit against San Francisco over its tax bill. The San Francisco Examiner reporting that the Jack Dorsey run company is suing its hometown for a $1.3 million refund on taxes. 
Square claiming that the city unfairly taxes it as a financial services company uh, when in fact it is an information company which is taxed at a lower rate in the city. And Netflix doubling down on the Indian market. The streamer inking a deal with influential Bollywood filmmaker Karan Johar, uh, who is considered among the most well-known people in India with a reputation for Bollywood. The video streaming industry in India is still relatively small and is expected to grow at about 22% a year, according to a recent study. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Kristen Scholler from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That is all our time tonight. Thanks so much for watching KSAT News at 9. I'm Myra Arthur. Have a good night.